I want you to remain standing. Let's read this word. It's very, just two verses, just two verses. Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, and read uh, together, either in your hand or on the screen. Uh, let's read together. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to this, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Come on, won't you thank God for that word already? Thank him for this word. Father, speak powerfully, clearly, in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to talk to you about transformational living. Amen. Uh, we're in this uh, book uh, of uh, Romans today, and we're in a series called Holy Habits. Everybody say Holy Habits. And uh, we're in this uh, series because we're trying to get believers. We're trying to get Christians. We're trying to get church folk to actually be Christ-like. We want you to be able to be identified as belonging to Christ. We want on the job people to be able to differentiate you from themselves if they do not know Christ. And Johnny and I were talking this week and uh, there is the thought that every other religious faith can be identified but Christians. Muslims, we know who they are. Hindus, we know who they are. But when it comes to us, it seems like, and I'll put it like this, what I said at 745 service, that we live a chameleon faith. In that on Sunday we look like Christians, but Monday through Saturday we blend in with everybody else. And we can't tell the difference. So we want to look at uh, this word today from the Apostle Paul and see if it will help us in our life. Uh, for he wrote uh, to the church at Rome uh, and in his book he wrote uh, to really get people to understand the nature of salvation, the, the salvation that came through faith in Jesus Christ. And what he's done for 11 chapters, he has dealt with theology and doctrine. And uh, you're, you know that we get our Roman road to salvation in, uh, in this this book. He's, he's dealt with the heavy stuff. But then in chapter 12, he changes from doctrine to practice. And that's where we as believers need to get. Many of us know the doctrine. We just having problems with the practice. We know that Jesus died on Calvary's cross, shed his blood for all of our sins. He was placed in a borrowed tomb and he rose on the what? Third day. We know that. We know that the Holy Spirit was promised and came down on the day of Pentecost. And the church was established. Now the Holy Spirit lives in all of us. 
we know that one day Jesus is coming back for the church. We know the doctrine. But where we are having problems with is the, the practice. The practice. That's why Paul wrote this therefore in chapter 12. Therefore, looking at all the doctrine, the wedges of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Therefore, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Therefore, it's time, Paul says, once you get the doctor down, it's time to live it. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to live it. If you have time to study this book, it all springs forth from chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Well, 17 is really the theme of the book. After Paul talks about this gospel, which is the righteousness of God, and, and he says it's first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Gospel, the good news is for everyone. But then he says in verse 17 that in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In this good news, God reveals his righteousness. And he wants us as his believers to live a righteous life. Y'all with me? The, the thing that we've got to change in the church world is that the only people that the church wants to live righteous is the pastor. Look at your neighbor. Righteousness is for all of us. <laughs> all of us. And so let's look at what righteousness is and see if, if your life is embracing it and we're going to go forth with this word. Righteousness, do you see that on the screen? Let's read it together. Righteousness is the what? The quality our condition is not there? Okay. Okay. Righteousness is the quality or condition of being in the what? Right relationship with who? With who? You see, we, we, we understand that. Hey, God, me and you, I love you. You, you save. Hey, God. That's where most of us major. Everything's right between me and, and him. But righteousness goes beyond that because there's not a period after God. There's a comma. Let's read the rest of it. That leads us to what? Live in what? Is it not up there? They moved it. I, did, I didn't ask you to move it. Let's go back. I'm still, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when to move it. That's good. We'll work together on this. That leads us to what? Right relationships with who? With others. And to do the Spike Lee thing. Do the right thing. 
okay? In, in this righteousness, we're supposed to live in right relationship, not just with God, but with others, with our parents, with our siblings, with our friends, with our church members. And then we're supposed to, wherever we are, do the, do the right thing. Do the right thing. 24-7, do the, do the right thing. Even if you're not with church folk, you're supposed to do the right thing. Now that is righteousness. Now we can go to the next slide. So when we look at this text, Paul is saying, it's time for you to live it. I'm all going to give you a good case for you being in Christ. Now it's time for you to live it. So this righteousness, and by the way, in the book of Romans, the word righteousness or its variation, just uh, or justified, this, this is so strong in the book of Romans, it's used over 60 times. Paul is serious about this stuff. So righteousness demands a devotion to Christ that is a living sacrifice. You know, we got that? A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. And what does it take to have this living sacrifice? Uh, Paul says it takes, in some Bibles, some translation says present your bodies. In some it says offer your bodies as a sacrifice. And that's where most of us have missed the mark. Because what we've done is say, God, you got my heart, you got my soul. It's not, I love you. I, I'm crazy about you. But God doesn't just want what's inside of you. He also wants what's outside of you. He wants your frame. It's your frame that goes to work. It's your frame that goes home. It's frame that deals with children and spouses. He wants your, your body. He wants that as an offering. He, he alludes to the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. You know where the Jews, uh, they had to get animals and, and they would bring the animals to the priests or have them offered up on an altar and then the, the smoke would go up from that, and they said, oh, the, that aroma was pleasing in God's sight. But look at what Paul is saying. No more of that. What God wants you to offer is you. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, God wants you. <laughs> look, look at your neighbor and say, he wants you. <laughs> All 110 pounds of you. Uh, Elder Johnson, would you go get some scales in here? Because we don't want to be lying. <laughs> Come on, he wants you. And our problem is you haven't given him you. You come when you want to to worship. You do what you want or what you don't want. You carry yourself any kind of way you want to when you leave here. And what he's saying is, he wants you. 
Look, look at this. He says, holy and pleasing to God. That means we talked about holiness last week. So he means dedicated to God, sacred, worthy of God, worthy. Bring that kind of body to, to him. And then Paul says, this is your reasonable service of worship your, or your reasonable act of worship. And we, we look at today, Sunday, we said this is a worship service. But in Paul's idea, worship is 24-7. Like, so for most of the church world, when the benediction is giving, that is the closing prayer, that's when they stop being Christian. And Paul said, that's not to be. It's 24-7. 24-7, I dedicate my life to God. 24-7, he has this body. 24-7, I'm surrendering to him. As the young people say, I'm withholding nothing. And so then he goes on further in this study and in the next verse he tells us how we are to get there which is so good he doesn't just say dedicate your body live holy please God you know seek God's will live according to God's will but he did tells us how to get there and and the way to get there in verse 2, is not to be, what? Conform to this world, but by the renewing of your, your mind. So, when he says don't be conformed, he says he means for us to refuse to model our lives after the world. Now, does anybody have any understanding of what he means by the world? Hmm? Hmm? You should because that's the system you left. And if you didn't leave it, that means you really need to Renew your walk with God. If nothing changed, if nothing changed, the world system, the dog eat dog, the betrayal system, the, the lying, the cheating, the stealing, uh, all of that, the me, myself, and I, if nothing changed, it's a good day to change. The world system, where if you get mad, you cuss somebody else out. Cuss them out. Come on, say, that's the world system. The world system. If you don't like somebody, you talk about them, you gossip, you run them down, you want what's worse for them, you'll even set a trap for them. That's the world system. If somebody did something to your child, you going to do something to their child. Everybody say, that's the world system. You was, you're supposed to have left that. So I, I refuse to, to live like that. I refuse to be like that. And the way to get there is to have a transformation to take place and that's what you're thinking. You see that? Be not conformed but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Of your mind. Now, I, this, this, this verse lets us know why we're missing it so bad. 
This, this word in the Greek is the same word we get metamorphosis from. And you know what the caterpillar goes and turns into a butterfly metamorphosis. It simply means change. Change. The renewing of our minds. And here's, here's our problem is that we are in church but not in the word. Am I making sense? In other words, no Wednesday nights, no Tuesday nights, no daily meditation, no groups, no, st no notes even during the sermon. We're in the church, but not in the word. word. So the change that needs to take place, the renewed mind, he's talking about our thinking. Our thinking. Our thinking has to change about God, about life, about family, about money. Our thinking has to change. Our attitude has to change. That's what Paul is saying. A transformation needs to take place in your attitude and the way you think. And here's what. We have the most precious help in this regard. If we would just get in this word, we have God himself through the Holy Spirit to teach us how to live. To help us understand this word. Help us learn how to be a father, how to be a wife, how to be a friend. How to avoid this, how to avoid that. When to speak, when to be silent. Holy Spirit. But it's going to take, and I'm telling you, listen to me, it's going to take you to develop some new habits. Let's go to the, to the next slide. And that last point was living according to God's will. Living according to God's word, will. The word and Holy Spirit would help you to live according to God's will. Amen? So transformational living dictates that we have what kind of habits? Come on, what kind of habits? Holy habits. See, life is built on habits. It's all about habits. Whether when you were out there in the world, look here, you knew, you knew when Friday night was coming. I mean, really. You, you couldn't wait till it was 5 o'clock. And, and, and you had a habit. You already had chosen out what you were going to wear Friday night. Anybody remember those days? You, you already had chosen out what you're going to wear, where you're going to go, what you're going to do. That was your habit. So, so now... We need some holy habits. Life is all about habits. If you're healthy or unhealthy, habits. You can blame your mama them. Well, my mama and my grandmama. But it's habits. If you're wasting money, habits. Is this making sense to anybody? So let's, let's all read this definition of habits. Habits are what? Our 
acquired, acquired, all of you came up in a particular family where you acquired some habits. Some we, we prayed before we ate some habits or we had to do chores to clean up, you know, we all had those. Then we got some more habits, went to school, college, you know, business, habits, habits, habits. They are acquired. And what Paul is trying to let us know is when we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are to acquire some new habits. A new pattern of living. A new way of thinking. Acquired behavior patterns regularly followed until they become routine and they shape your character. Amen? Now, I've been reading a lot on, on habits and, and one, one of the members mentioned last week, have you got had the book or got the Atomic habits? I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I said, I'll quote some from James Clear this week. And it really does go with the points I'm about to bring. Habits. Whether they're habits for your health, your family, or for you to live a righteous life, this applies to you too. James Clear says in his book, Atomic Habits, Humans are motivated by the anticipation of reward. Did y'all hear that? Humans are motivated by the anticipation of reward. So making habits attractive will help you stick to them. Make them attractive. And that's what Paul has tried to let us know. These things are, are attractive. You get to live God's will. You get to please God. You get transformed by the way you're thinking. A whole lot better than the way you've been thinking. So I want to put before you some holy habits that I believe will help us live out these two verses. The first one that I want to put out uh, before you is community relationships. We can go to the next slide. Community relationships. We need to get in a new habit of wanting to be with each other except just on Sunday. Amen? Let's read this, this scripture together. Colossians 3, 15 through 17 from the Message Bible. Y'all ready? Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with, with, with each other. Each other. In step with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Each other. Look at, look at what the translation says. None of this going off doing your own thing. Your own thing, Christianity. Your own thing, righteousness. Your own thing, Bible study. Your own thing, you your own pastor. You your own counselor. You your own teacher. I don't, you, I don't need nobody else. It's just between me and God. He said, and cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, uh, let, look, let the word of Christ, the message, have full run in the house. Give it plenty of room in your life. Everybody say that. Give it plenty of room. Uh, instruct and direct. Look at this. Instruct and direct. One another, 
using good common sense and sing to your hearts, sing your hearts to God and let every detail of your lives, words, action, whatever be done in the name of the master, Jesus. Thanking God the Father every step of the way. Come on, thank God right now. Every step of the way. Thank you, God. Thank you. Now, the next slide, next slide. Transformation in one's life, I believe this to my heart, comes best with others in a group. And, and since James Clear says, you need to have a reward to put before people, let me tell you what the reward is. This comes from uh, Purpose Driven Church. It is the best place to practice real fellowship. That's a reward. Real fellowship. See, we, what we call fellowship in the old churches, go to the fellowship hall, get you a plate, and eat the food and talk about this some good fried chicken. Lord, who, who, who you think made this potato salad? Yeah, sister so-and-so. And then I hope they got enough for me to take a plate home. That's not real fellowship. When we don't get to know each other. When you don't know what's going on in my life, how God is using me, and I don't know how God is using you, and, and you don't give me something to pray for, and I don't give you something to pray for. Here's the benefits, the rewards. It helps you apply the word of God better because you can use me as a model, I can use you as a model. Next, it offers support from other members when you're under stress. You don't have to go through your stress or your mess by yourself. And look here, it's a safe place for you to develop your gifts, passion, abilities, personality, and experiences. And you know what? We, we probably would not let most of you sing up here on the stage with a mic in your hand. But you can sing in your group. They'll let you sing. At least one time they'll let you. But it's a safe place. Everybody says it's a safe place. It's a natural, relaxed way to share your faith with unbelievers. And that's where we have to go to with our groups. Uh, we have to get them outside of these four walls where they're touching people and inviting them to their groups. Amen. Everybody say that's a holy habit. It's being with Christians. Because your other habit was being with those other folk. And you know where that got you. <laughs> the next holy habit is prayer and fasting. Matthew 6 and 6, but, but when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is one of the few scriptures that really encourages you to pray alone. And look at what the word says. Uh, and Jesus was correcting a practice. Don't try to pray in public using these long prayers and these cliches and rhyming and hooking things up. But Jesus says, get by yourself and pray to your father who is unseen. Now, here's the benefit. Then your father who sees what is done in secret, and I like what other translations say, he will reward you in, in public. Oh, Lord. And that's up. Uh, so when you transform your habit, when you start praying consistently to God through prayer, uh, it is knowing that you're going to get a return on the time you spent on your knees. There's going to be a return. Uh, 
the knees may hurt, but there's going to be a return. Come on, somebody. You may have cried during your prayer, but there's going to be a return. You may have uh, had a lot of stress on you when you got down there, but there's going to be a return. You've got to be in a practice of prayer no matter what. I'm going to pray about this thing. I'm going to take this thing to God, and I'm going to believe that everything is going to be all right. Everybody else is worried, but I'm not going to worry. I'm going to pray. And then it says, God will reward you publicly. Amen? Amen. Now, uh, then he says, uh, fasting, fasting, fasting. In the same chapter, uh, Jesus says, but when you fast, and he was correcting the practice because back then, the people who were fasting wanted everybody else to know they were fasting so they could get some pats on the back. Oh, she's so spiritual. Oh, he's He's real. He says, when you fast, put on oil, wash your face, and so it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret, there it is again, what's done in secret, he will reward you. And we have two fasts this year. In fact, we got one coming up in August. And we open up the year with Daniel fast. But what this is saying is that you should have some personal fast. You should have some personal fast. I do that throughout the year. I have some personal fast. You can do a day, two days, three days, whatever you want to do, your own. Just your relationship with God, you know, uh, abstaining for something, to be with God, to talk with God. And what happens is that what you abstain for, God nourishes you with his power. He will fill the gap. Amen? And, and the beautiful thing is that with fasting as with prayer, he's going to bless you publicly. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And that's the, that's the beautiful thing. You did it in private, but he's going to bless you publicly. Uh, people are going to be able to see that he, you have been blessed, that God opened that door for you, that God changed that thing around, that God got that child through school, that you got through that sickness uh, and that disease. They're going to be able to see that publicly. But it was all due to what you did privately. Amen? Amen. And the last holy habit I just want to leave with you is this habit of faith. Habit of faith. Can people distinguish you by your faith? Do they know you to be a man or woman of faith. Romans 1 and 17 says, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. The righteous will call those things that be not as though they are. The righteous will live knowing that God is going to come through. The righteous will stand on it and say that I'm going to be all right. My family is going to be all right. Come on, somebody. That I'm going to get through this little storm because I believe God. Come on, any faith people in here. Come on, you you got to have a holy habit. Come hell or high water, I've got some faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yeah, yeah, everybody else is wearing, everybody else is crying, everybody else about to jump off the cliff, but you've got 
faith. And I like the, the song and the song that the kids sang. They said, the righteous will, won't be forsaken. Do y'all hear that? The righteous won't be forsaken. So you got to live by your trust, your confidence, your faith in God. Come on, say, I'm going to live by faith. Come on, I'm going to live by faith. Come on, say, I'm a faith person. Come on, my faith is increasing. The, in the Old Testament, they lived by these altars. They would bring an offering up to God. An offering would be slain. And then they would be set on fire. And that's what would go up to God. That was based on the law. The righteousness was based on the law. And that's what they had to do. God has given me and you the opportunity to not have to offer nothing dead that's going to be killed. We get rid of that system. God says now the new offering is you. Come on, the new offering is you. Don't nothing have to die except your old habits and your old ways. But the new offering is you. Don't you stand to your feet and you're going to give God yourself. Come on, say, I, I will offer me. I will offer me. I will offer me. He wants your body. He wants you. And if you'll do that, <laughs> if you'll do that, I'm telling you, life is going to change. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If you develop those habits, community relationships, prayer and fasting, yes. and faith, uh, it all takes you giving him you. Yes. And he's going to bless you. We're going to give an invitation now. Father, uh, we trust that this word has gone forth. We trust that everyone has understood plainly what you want. You want them. So we pray, God, that you would lead us to some holy habits community relationships, some holy habits, prayer and fasting, some holy habits, having trust, confidence and faith in you, assurance in you. Uh, God bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, get a Lord a hand clap of praise.